morning. It's wonderful to have the privilege and honor of being here. My parents taught me as a young boy to always enter a room listening, not speaking. So I find it a little odd to arrive in a place as rich and overwhelming, as full and complex as this is, and to suddenly immediately find myself speaking. This is not my instinct. This was not the manners that I was taught. This is not even close to wise, actually. <laughs> but I accept the invitation, and I'm grateful and honored uh, to be here and pray for God to take what we're going to reflect on out of the Gospel of Matthew and use it in some way this week. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel. We're going to be focusing on different sections of the Sermon on the Mount. But as we begin, I want to just set it a little bit in its context. Matthew's gospel is a gospel of surprise. It's a gospel that is really, in some ways, a gospel that I've thought of as smelling salts. It's as though Matthew is sticking this gospel under our nose and saying, now breathe deeply, and I, I dare you to stay asleep. If you hear Matthew's gospel with anything like the conviction and passion that it's filled with, we cannot find ourselves sleepwalking through life. This is a wakefulness. Matthew of the four Gospels, in my view, is the most assaulting, it's the most challenging, it's the most uncomfortable of the four Gospels. And it is so because, in fact, its portrait of Jesus is a portrait of Jesus that is really so filled with a sense of the, the power and authority of Jesus to accomplish what he's come to actually do. And to not only demonstrate it himself, but to actually call us to be people who walk and live in that, that this is what we see over and over again. The Gospel of Matthew in chapters 1 to 4 gives us a kind of preface. It's like the opening, really, to the Gospel. In chapter 1, where we see the genealogy, we are in one sense being given a very traditional-sounding text. It appears to be a text like many other genealogical texts in the Bible, except this one has the names of four really unexpected women, women who were not part of Israel, women who were by no means part of the great hall of faith, people who were seen often as people that would have been easily neglected in Israel's history. This is not the kind of family chatter at a family occasion when you would bring up the names of Rahab and others. And yet here in the genealogy, it's as though Matthew is giving us a very profound foretaste of saying, so do you understand that in the genealogy that will ultimately lead finally to the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David, that this process is going to involve whomever God chooses to use. And in this amazing, subtle, and profound way, Matthew just begins to quietly let this extraordinary sense of the God who holds all history, who is at work underneath and in and throughout everything, set the stage using whoever God chooses to use to accomplish whatever God chooses to do. And then we turn from the genealogy almost without comment to a story, really, of the birth narrative, which we know well, not least, perhaps, being here. The birth narrative, which, in a way, has almost nothing to do with the genealogy, that he's just very carefully laid out 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. Oh, and by the way, now here comes the Messiah, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the line of Joseph. Again, an amazing statement of this sense that, and God will do what God will choose to do in the way that God chooses to do it. And then the birth of the Messiah is not the declaration of an authority. It's not the declaration of, a, of an earthly authority, a person who's going to somehow reign in all of the classic ways that a Messiah would have been anticipated. No, instead, the language is really quite special language. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us or earlier, she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. These were not the classic words that were used to describe the anticipation of the Messiah. As many of us know, and as probably many in this room have preached on, this is a God of surprise. It's a Messiah of surprise. It's an unexpectedness, an intimacy and a change, a transformation. And then in a way that's really very much in contrast to Luke's gospel, which then gives us much more of a pastoral scene of Jewish shepherds. Here, instead, Matthew's gospel, which is really in a way a public gospel, a gospel for like in a life in a public sphere and in a sphere in which there are competing religions and worldviews. 
there is a strong sense that we turn next, of course, to the wise men, to the story of, of the stars with a, a testimony, I think, in Matthew's way of telling the story that the one who has been born is one who actually affects the stars in the sky. And the stars in the sky contain and, re, and inscribe and anticipate the birth of this little baby born to be God with us, saving us from our sins. And furthermore, not only that, but then in the story with the encounter with Herod, the birth immediately puts the narrative of Jesus in the line of the political and social realities of Palestine at that particular time. It's an encounter that makes a claim on Herod, a, a petty demagogue who had this kind of wild megalomania that he often defended with outrageous anger and brutality. And now he hears that one born king of the Jews has been born. Where, he wonders. Come back and tell me, he says to the, tr to the wise men. Come and tell me when and where this has happened. But what it leads to, of course, as you know, is not only great fear on his part, but then a genocide that immediately occurs just after this. So suddenly, we're not even two full chapters into Matthew's gospel. And the reality of the gospel that's being told us in this opening set of verses in Matthew's gospel is a gospel that intersects with social and political reality, with structures of power that are going to be reordered and renamed and redefined by the reality of what this Messiah, born King of the Jews, to save his people from their sins, who will be God with us, is actually interrupting the political sphere. And then, as though that's not enough, then of course, as we know, Jesus and his family become the first refugees in the New Testament. And the whole narrative takes on a story that is very similar, of course, to the narrative of Israel's own life, but now is written into Jesus' own birth and early childhood. And then, again, as though all of that is not enough, then eventually we hear the story of, of the way that all of those circumstances completely recast Jesus' opening years. Then there's a great gap. We have no idea, or almost no idea, what happens, you could say, between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. What was Jesus doing for 30 years? Making chairs? <laughs> Sawing tables? The world that was disrupted by his presence was going to hell, and Jesus we're not told really almost anything about what happens in those years. And then suddenly, suddenly at the beginning of chapter three, the narrative all begins again with this incredible sense of John the Baptist, who ultimately is seen now as one who ended the Old Testament prophetic line, announcing that the kingdom of God is at hand, rep repent and be baptized. Jesus himself submits to that baptism. And submitting to that baptism receives this extraordinary blessing. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And with hardly a breath between that and the next section, Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and experiences the temptations. Jesus is now inside the story of what it means to be a political, social, religious, and moral human being. And now in the context of all that, then out of that comes the moment where he begins to call his disciples. And he begins to call them in the most interesting way, echoing in part Emmanuel, God with us. When he calls his disciples, he simply calls them to follow him, to be with him. It's not a call at the, initially to go and do something. It's a call to be with someone. And this story unfolds around the narrative of their presence and identification with Jesus. Christian discipleship is is not about projects in the world. It's not about activity and structures. It's about identification with a person. And here, from the very beginning, discipleship is understood and, and identified with this sense of an intimate and personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ, with whom we are meant to dwell and imitate and respond and engage and serve and love. And as that all happens, then the ministry begins to unfold. And then in a summary way that is just so remarkable, just as we come to the end of chapter 4, it, we read these verses. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, 
Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. By the time we come to this summary paragraph at the end of chapter 4, what we're hearing is that this unusual birth, an unusual beginning to his life, a set of dramatic social and political circumstances of fleeing, ultimately a gap, then, then a beginning again, then a baptism, then a call to, for people to be with him, and then this earthly ministry that experiences and expresses all of the summation of a world in raw need, raw pulsating need. By the time we come to the end of chapter four, it's all there. The pain and the suffering of being not only finite human beings, but broken human beings, needy human beings, voraciously hungry for God's blessing, for something that is hope, an evidence of the presence of something that would be greater than their disease, greater than their social stigma. And in the reality of this little paragraph, there is, of course, embedded this sense that Jesus drew to himself a whole new kind of humanity. This wasn't a Jewish crowd only. This was a crowd of people that came from a variety of places and a variety of instincts and a variety of needs, and they all came magnetically drawn to the life and ministry and love of Jesus Christ. And it's there that then Matthew pauses and we begin with the first body of five bodies of teaching in Matthew's gospel, the first being the best known, the Sermon on the Mount. But we come to that body of teaching on the cusp, as Matthew tells the story, on the cusp of this remarkable portrait of Jesus having drawn to himself this amazing, eclectic, raw, needy crowd of people. And Jesus, it seems to me, the text suggests, sees those crowds, those crowds that day or any other day, and he sees this array. And the text simply says at the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. These three chapters, chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, are some of the best-known teaching of Jesus. And it's for good reason that we come to this text, I think, as a place of reflection on these days at this conference. I want to suggest that we should begin by looking first at verses 13 to 16 and then come back to the Beatitudes. Because my reading, at least, of this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is what makes us salt and light, what enables us to enact our identity, is actually set up in the Beatitudes. But the place in which we're headed, the, the life which we are meant to live, a life that is meant to be marked by salt and light in the world, are qualities which we reach because of the blessing of the Beatitudes. But let's begin, at the, in a way, the trajectory and then work back to the beginning. To be salt and light in a context like 
the one that Jesus is alive in or the one that he's alive in today with us here is to be in a context in which it's clear that the world needs salt. That is, it needs restraint on the forces of decay. The forces of decay that are mental and emotional and social and political and economic. And the people of God, the, the followers of Jesus, those who are with him, are meant to be evidences of that kind of restraint on evil in the world. And when good people do nothing, we fail to be that restraint. But when good people do what it is that we're called to do, to be agents of the, the salt of the kingdom, then our life, our words, our action, our pursuit of justice and righteousness and mercy in the world is all meant to be an action in the world which restrains the decay. Now, if we lose our saltiness, Jesus suggests, if we lose in some measure our identity, if we fail to actually live out the circumstance of what this life is meant to be about, then in fact, it's really something that might as well just be thrown away. But if in fact we are living into our identity, if in fact we are the salt of the earth, then we actually are a force of the kingdom in the world that is falling apart. We're here to think about worlds falling apart. We're here in a part of the world that is falling apart. The nature of this conference is an awareness that in measures sometimes great and sometimes less great, but always it seems dramatically, this is a part of the world where things are falling apart. And falling apart not in incidental ways or in ways that are inconsequential except to just a few people. No, they are consequential because they exist on a world stage and because this is the unique place that it is in the world and in world history. And because, in fact, the suffering that's identified here is the suffering that can also, in other measures and in other places, be found as well. We live in a world where the evidences of a world falling apart seem all too easily found. We wouldn't have to think long or hard at all with any degree of intelligence to, to simply wander down almost any street in any urban center and in most countries in the world and readily find evidences of a world in decay. So one of the questions that comes, I think, at the end of chapter 4 is, so people are drawn to Jesus because Jesus gives them something which they hunger for, but what's the evidence that in fact there's a broader, greater hope than somehow just simply being in touch with Jesus alone. What's interesting about the Sermon on the Mount and interesting in the Beatitudes is that the blessing that God wants to give is a blessing that falls to a community. He calls first to disciples and then he asks, uh, wants to bless that community so that through that community, the evidence of the kingdom that is at hand, he says, is now a kingdom that is being demonstrated, enacted, embodied, by the life that you and I live. So the evidence of that reality is an evidence that's meant to make a real difference in whatever circumstances that we may dwell. That is a remarkable reality. And then Jesus uses this other metaphor, similar but different, that we are meant to be the light of the world. Just as you don't turn to a world of darkness and blame it for its darkness, but ask where is light? So Jesus, I think, is saying to the, to the disciples, to those who are hearing him. We are meant to live out an identity in which we bring light into a dark world, a world with confusion mentally and morally and psychologically and spiritually and politically. Are we able? Are we free? Are we pursuing being agents of the light of Christ in the world? That's the trajectory that Jesus has in mind. And it's for that trajectory that I think he starts as he does with the, what we call the Beatitudes, the declarations of blessing. He blesses in order to create and establish a people who will be salt and light. He doesn't bless just for the sake of our receiving blessing. This is the great tragedy and horror, actually, of, of, of consumer Christianity. A vision of Christianity in which God is just somehow giving me, usually me, the isolated I, giving me the thing that I want that's going to give me a sense of my place in the world. No, God wants to bless us in order that in giving that blessing, we will be agents of blessing in the world. This was part of the original covenant with Abraham. It's a consistent part of Hebrew scriptures, and it is certainly a part of the teaching of Jesus. We are meant to be salt and light, a blessing 
in a world of decay and darkness. And how do we become such people? We become such people by receiving this extraordinary blessing. The Beatitudes begin with the Beatitude that is often taken to be, in a way, the frame around all of these blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In shorthand, this text is almost like saying there is good news. You can be poor, profoundly poor. Here, Matthew uses the strongest word for poor that he could use to describe the poverty of the people that he's describing. Blessed are the acutely, dramatically, urgently, devastatingly poor. In spirit, not to try to evade anything about physical poverty, but to acknowledge that it is a poverty that is both physical and spiritual. It is a poverty that pervades life, that leaves us weakened and empty, a sense of a vacuum, an utter destitution. And for people who find themselves in those circumstances or anywhere along that spectrum, there is good news. For blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is as though Jesus is throwing his arms as wide as possible to a world of extraordinary need. Imagine with me for a moment the needs of people that you know very near. In this room, perhaps. And very far away. It's as though here Jesus begins his teaching by saying these arms of God's blessing are extended as far and wide and deep as human need goes. Blessed are you. There is no one in such need who's unseen. There's no one in such need who's not known, whose love but from God is not extended. There will be mysteries about this, mysteries that Jesus himself will actually talk about later in the Gospels, about the sense of God's delay, God's wait, God's silence, all those things which are legitimate questions of faith and doubt. But here, here what Jesus is wanting to simply deeply, warmly affirm is that there is nothing beyond this embrace. No one falls through the cracks. It is this remarkable portrait of a God of the most profound kind of love. Blessed are you if you are empty-handed and poor. If you have very little, God is with you and for you and will give you the kingdom of heaven. As though, obviously, by contrast, suggesting somebody who thinks that they have absolutely nothing being given the most exquisite, consummate gifts imaginable. And it's in that frame that then all the other Beatitudes, I think, unfold. The theme continues, the theme of fundamental human neediness, an acknowledgement of emptiness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When we think about Palestine and Israel and the Middle East, when we think about the wider world, we think about the Syrian refugees. We think about people, millions and millions of people who are refugees around the world. People who today for all kinds of social and economic and spiritual reasons are mourning, whose fundamental experience today is an experience of loss, of emptiness, of void. How amazing that Jesus knowing that human reality would say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. And blessed are those who are empty and who feel as though life is utterly about what has been lost. To you, there is comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Continuing really in this same sort of vein, it's as though Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are really flat. Flat in circumstances, flat in capacity perhaps, flat in significance, 
flat in meaning, flat in power, flat in influence, people whose lives are but seem to be so little. One commentator says, blessed are the little guys. The suggestion is this amazing sense that, again, the God of the universe pronouncing through Jesus here in this moment a blessing on the most vulnerable. Now, it's profound to me that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount in this way. He's going to go on and talk about the blessings and gifts that he wants to give to people who, who have greater capacity, greater energy, greater faith, greater readiness to, to actually respond. But here in the opening of the Beatitudes, it's vulnerability. It's about vulnerability. I don't know about you, but when I come to places in, in such need as Palestine, the long history, the tortured, complex history, and I think about the significance of what it is that we're here to think about, and I think about the overwhelming, staggering needs, and I think about the layers of political thickness that make engagement and change so difficult to accomplish. And when the struggles are so real, and when the, the checkpoint lines are so long, and when the routine of this long, protracted, it seems unending reality goes on here every day, but it goes on in some form that also brings about great suffering and angst to so many people in other parts of the world in other social circumstances where again the loss is so great the emptiness is so great the void is so great the poverty can feel so great that to begin the sermon on the mount with this extraordinary message of blessing is to say we can walk anywhere and into any setting and realize that the god that we are hearing about in this blessing is a God who holds that suffering, who understands and identifies with it, who has come to be with us, who is for us in the midst of vulnerability. Especially as a tall, white, educated American male, it's easy to go straight to the list of the to-dos, straight to the list of the things that, that I should somehow be able to do in the world that should somehow make a difference. Just turns out that doesn't really matter very much. And it certainly doesn't matter enough and it can be as wrong as it can sometimes be right. But what Jesus says here is that it doesn't start with your action or mine. It's, it's the God who holds all things, who holds the vulnerable and the marginalized, the people that are put at the edges, the people who are unseen and unloved, the people whose vulnerability and neediness is so acute. And Jesus simply says, you are seen and you are loved and you are given great and profound gifts right in the midst of this. Now, one of the tensions of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes in particular is that there's this refrain, as you know, in each of the Beatitudes. This is your condition and this will be your blessing. It's interesting that there's no language in between that says, and that will happen on Thursday at 12. It just doesn't say that. It doesn't say, you know, it's just one more year. It's actually now just 11 months. It's just, it's, no, it's actually just eight months. No, it's really today, it's just six. It's just a month from now. And this will all be done. You will be fully, holy, and completely comforted. That's not the portrait. It's this, it's this sense of anticipation of this broad range. In some ways, it is an eschatological hope. And in, in, in certain ways, that eschatological hope does begin today but it also will take until eternity for it to actually be consummately present. But because of that ambiguity, we should not use that uncertainty of time as an occasion to then just be lax, as though to say, well, it will happen in some future era of time, and for now, I'm just going to focus in on my own need or on the need of those that I most know or most love or that are most like me or that I most like. Now here, Jesus is proclaiming a blessing that begins now, though it may take for eternity for it to be completely fulfilled. But it begins today. And you are meant to be, and I am meant to be, a person in community with others who are given to this blessing, both first and foremost receiving it. Some of you may have come here from circumstances that have left you really profoundly depleted. The God that gives this blessing is the God that knows your depletion. The God that knows your vulnerability, your weakness. 
None of us comes to this conference and thinks this is going to be the solution of the Israeli-Palestinian problem. It will happen today, here. No, we, that's not our circumstance. And if we've been at the work of justice, if we've been at the kingdom work that God may call us to for, for years, decades, for a lifetime, we may easily find ourselves in various seasons profoundly depleted, mourning, needing, 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 always needing the blessing of God. Jesus goes on to say that there are things that those who receive such blessings can do and that will bring still more blessing, not as a consequence, but because it's needed. And that's where he turns next. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness in Matthew's gospel is never an attitude or just a spiritual condition. It's an enacted reality. To be righteous is to live in a way that demonstrates the life and character of God in the world. You're not righteous if you just are, as it were, saved. That's Pauline language. In Matthew's language, it's different. Matthew's language, to be righteous is to be a person who actually imitates the life of God. To be righteous is to be somebody who actually acts in a godlike way in circumstances. And if you are those who hunger or thirst for acting in a godlike way, then you will be filled. It's as though he's portraying a blessing that will strengthen us in that work that we're called to. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. It's interesting that this word in Matthew's gospel may be the word that most captures the nature of what Matthew means by grace. It's repeated at many critical times in Matthew's gospel. And it's a word that conveys this, this great sense of just the magnanimous generosity of God that sees what is needed and just gives us what is needed. Blessed are the merciful. So to be merciful is to be a person who, who imitates the life of God and you will be given mercy as a consequence. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's interesting that at a moment like this, it's almost as though he's saying, blessed are the innocent in heart. I think it's not exactly innocence, as though it's na about naivete. It's purity. It's about clarity. It's about a kind of groundedness in reality that permeates our heart. And it will give us the capacity. It will lead us to the blessing of being able to see God because we will have a capacity to be able to see what we couldn't otherwise perhaps even envision. And then in the next three, there is this mounting sense of the drama of what this blessing will incur upon us. First, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We are enactors of this grace. We're not just observers or proclaimers. We're enactors. We're meant to be the demonstration, the evidence, again, of shalom. We're meant to be the people who stand in the gap. We're meant to be the people who, who pursue righteousness and justice with peace, who in the context of, of that reality stand right in the place of those kinds of vulnerable needs and demonstrate. And if we are that, then we are children of God. We begin to look like the God who gave us life. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Here, the tension is, is mounting and growing. If you are a peacemaker, it will not be an easy thing for you. There is a sense that the trajectory is peacemaking will lead actually not to a happy and easy life. Peacemaking will lead to persecution because there are a lot of people that are invested in the absence of peace. There's a lot of people that are invested in serious injustice in the world and who don't want peace to be established. There's a lot of people who have a great stake in instability, in injustice, in suffering of others, because that simply serves their own interest. We could think again across the broad global landscape of political leaders and social leaders in so many contexts who are simply fundamentally given, it seems, to acts of injustice, of, of extraordinary abuses of power, and causing the suffering of people simply because they can. But it's also true that there are roughly 200, 2.5 billion people who live outside the rule of law, where there is no one or no one to turn to that could in some way be their advocate. And in that context, it's just really the bully that wins. Whoever the bully may be just comes along and in a predatory way simply takes advantage of the opportunism of that. Whatever it may be, to be identified with Jesus is to be vulnerable to the possibility in fact, the probability of persecution for righteousness' sake. 
It's not just because you're being persecuted. It's because you're persecuted because you're trying to act and live a life that looks like the life of God in the world. People are made uncomfortable with that. They have their own claims, their own realities, their own worldviews, and it will change us. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Here Jesus now takes all this persecution even more personally. This is not just going to be a public act. This is going to come because you're identifying with me. And to be identifying with me is going to put you in a context where, in fact, the persecution is going to grow. But in the midst of that, too, there will be blessing. Rejoice, Jesus says, and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, if we're persecuted for the sake of Jesus, we stand in a great long line of the persecuted. And though it is not our goal to be persecuted, it is our goal to follow Jesus. But the context in which we do that will put us in a context in which the suffering that may come as a result of that puts us in the line of others who, like those that have gone before us, have tried to simply be faithful to the God who led us. And it's after all that long line of blessings that then Jesus says as we began, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We come to this conference for many different reasons. I'm sure there are all kinds of purposes that we each have. There are questions that we bring. There's motivations. There's uncertainties. There's arguments that we're having in our head or that we're having with friends or family. There's places that we find ourselves in circumstances where we're anything but at ease. We come here maybe out of deep conviction. Some come here out of deep personal suffering, identification with this particular place and these particular issues that are so profound and at the core of what we're considering for the rest of, of this conference. But in each of these three mornings, I want us to just pause and realize that our engagement in those realities starts at a deeper place than the circumstances of political and, real, uh, political and social and economic reality. It's deeper. It goes into the very core of what it means to be human. And this situation, as so many situations, exposes our raw need. It demonstrates the torturedness of how badly we can treat one another. It names the reality of human suffering and rivets our attention. And that same work has a capacity to hear about it than a potential word of despair. Unless we begin with the Beatitudes, with a God who has come near to be with us, a God who has come to identify with us, to save us from our sins, and who walks with us with a, as a God of blessing into a context of poverty and need and vulnerability because that God, this God, is a God who is changing reality and using us to be witnesses as light and salt to that great purpose. Friends, may it be that over these days, we open ourselves to a fresh blessing, Bless each other. Seek in these days to just bless each other, to listen well to each other, to attend to each other, to see each other, to bless each other with these words of encouragement, to realize that the God who is with and behind that blessing is a God who holds the trauma, the anxiety, the fear, the uncertainties, the dangers, the pain, the suffering, the vulnerability. But that God is a God who says, Blessed are you, for you are mine. Lord, by your grace, as we come to the start of this day, a day where we're going to be thinking about great challenges, great dilemmas, great vulnerabilities, it's just so urgent that we understand again in the very core of our being that you are a God of blessing, not as a kind of sugar coating, but as a God who sees our, and knows our profound need and who offers us in response your very best life and gifts. May we live out of this blessedness. To the glory of your name we pray. Amen.